Number one, fear. For almost all of my early childhood and young adult life, fear was the single most powerful emotion I felt. Not love, not laughter, not anger, but fear. It drove my every thought, my every feeling. It was for years the impetus behind every motivation and every action. Whether at home or school, asleep or awake, fear followed me like a stalking monster, like a waking nightmare, driving me to do things most kids and even most adults would never have imagined doing. I don't know how, but early on I somehow knew I had to face my fear. I had to climb that tree when most kids were barely walking, swim those ponds and lakes and rivers when most were still in their bathtubs, play in the surf at high tide while still wearing diapers, and watch out for sharks, sea snakes, stingrays, giant crabs and jellyfish while most kids were playing tugboat and building sandcastles. By the time I was four, I was watching out for alligators, snapping turtles and crawdads, and piranhas while playing in the backyard drainage ditch off the St. John's River. But nothing ever scared me more, or prepared me for what happened at my best friend Jerry's house on New Year's Eve in our senior year of high school. It was perfect. Jerry's parents were in Florida for the holidays, Christmas and New Year's and weren't expected back until January 5th, 1972. We just celebrated Christmas the previous year, 1971, at my mother's house, while she and my compulsive gambler, bad check writing, ex-con, bisexual stepfather had gone to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to bet on horses. Jerry's house was on the opposite side of Southwest 9th Street from my mother's house on Southwest 12th, about three blocks south and two doors down was the Dairy Queen, the Holiday Theater, and a little Italian pizza joint called Giuseppe's that made a hot sausage sandwich to die for, especially after an all-nighter of stolen beer, when we weren't old enough to buy beer yet, herb, sativa coming up through Mexico, and LSD-25, supposed to be part of Timothy Leary's private stash, but who knows. It was incredibly good. Earlier that summer, right in front of the theater, was where Jerry, me, Tom, Rick, Mike, and Alan, the original Dark Side of the Moon loons, were crossing Southwest 9th Street at about 2 a.m. on a Saturday night. When looking back, we discovered Jerry lying flat on his back in the middle of the street after hitting a car on his way across. Not getting hit by a car, but hitting the side of a 40 mile per hour moving vehicle when he suddenly gets up and starts scrambling for his glasses right in the middle of the street. Naturally, the rest of us sprung into action, directing traffic, screaming and yelling, cursing and laughing, horns blaring, tires screeching, and here's 16 year old Jerry, all 6 foot 2 and 250 pounds of him, getting back up and trotting over with a shit-eating grin on his face, completely unfazed, heading to Giuseppe's to get the best hot sausage sandwich on the south side. We glibbed to die for. Jerry's parents' house was one of those two-story, residential-style farmhouses that were built back in the 30s off FDR's New Deal and purchased on the GI Bill for returnees and their families coming back from the war. Jerry's dad, John Campbell, was one such. He was reputed to have been in the bulge and sent home for a leg injury where he lived in that house with his wife since 1945 and where he sired four sons and two daughters. He was retired from working with Firestone Tire and that house meant everything to him. We all knew how important it was like the Christmas party at my mother's place. To make sure everything was cool, nothing was stolen, nothing was damaged, and everything was back in its place when his parents got home. By 7 p.m., cars were lined up on both sides of Miller Street, and there were friends, school buddies, relatives, siblings, cousins, 
and rival school heads from Hoover, Roosevelt Valley, and East High Schools. We'd laid down the law about treating Jerry's parents' house with respect, so there were no fights, no challenges, no meetings in the back alley, and absolutely no rough shit in the bedrooms. I remember looking out over the vast wall-to-wall -wall crowd from just inside the solid oak and beveled glass front door, which was closed against the cold. Marveling through the thick smoke of tobacco and herb and Pink Floyd's metal at the sheer number of people that were on the floors, in the living room, in the kitchen, in the bedrooms, in the attic, in the backyard, and even on the roof, smoking, drinking, tripping, and ready to whoop it when the clock struck twelve, all the while on the lookout, sneaking peeks throughout the frosty glass at more coming up the drive along the streets, through the yards, and in through the front door, or the open garage door, and the backyard kitchen door, when a police car arrived with its lights on, but no siren. Normally, I would be the one to go out and greet them, and to get a feel for whether we were in trouble or not, and averting a panic whenever I could. When turning around to look at Jerry, who was standing right behind me, I let him know in as quiet a voice as possible that it's the police. Then everything went completely silent. Even the music sounded like it was coming from a great distance and through a thick wall. When all of a sudden a wave swept over the entire house I and mean, you could feel it, followed by a smell like I've never smelled before. It was like the kind of smell you've heard about in movies or read about in books coming off a herd of cattle or horses when they get a whiff of death, spooking them into a blind stampede of fear and desperation. It had to be what it smelled like on the battlefield, I thought, or just before a convict was executed. First it was the smell that had everyone suddenly getting up on their feet and turning, and then it was the fear that got them running straight for the back door trampling the ones in front, boys, girls, men, women, children, terrified out of their minds, and just like them, I found myself swept up in it too. It was like running in a nightmare, to get away from something you can't see but you know is there. And no matter how hard or how fast you run, you just can't seem to shake it. But there was no waking up from this nightmare. There was only automatic blind panic. The feeling was narcotic, contagious, primal, visceral, like trying to run away from an earthquake or a hurricane, and like hiding from a tornado, or trying to outrun a flash fire. There's no thought, no reason, no conception, just pure gut reflex, like taking your hand off a hot burner too late, or cutting yourself to the bone with a sharp knife, or getting into a fight with someone, and in the fury, pounding them so hard you only realized later what could have happened if someone hadn't been there to pull you off. And the looks on the faces of my friends and neighbors now become human animals. Many I knew in school and as fellow students, colleagues and acquaintances, but now they all looked and smelled and acted like people I'd never seen before, anguished, angry and contorted, terror-stricken, pale, gray, white, yellow, green and black. Worse than any George Romero film I'd ever seen. Worse than any nightmare I'd ever had. When Jerry fled with Tom in front and my brother Rick behind, we woke up momentarily to find ourselves in Jerry's basement, clambering our way into the old coal chute adjacent to the furnace. It was completely pitch with stored boxes and old furniture, and we found ourselves desperately clawing our way in and stacking boxes behind us against the door and waiting for what none of us ever knew. Who knows how long we were in there. We just remember being the first to ask, What are we doing, Jerry? Jerry, Tom, Alan, Rick. I heard crying. Jerry sure picked the perfect time to freak out, I thought. That's how he'd act when he dropped too much acid and drank too much alcohol. It was little more than a vegetable for the rest of the night, 
who had to be tended and watered. Either that or he was too afraid to talk. I only realized later it was the latter, and he wasn't the only one. What's going on, Jerry? I rasped. Still, no answer. I remember whispering, almost humming, as I began to lift box after box we'd stacked in our haste to get away from whatever it was we were hiding from and talking in hushed tones to not alert anyone about where we were or what we were doing. Sweating from the heat and confinement in a room that wasn't meant for human habitation and slowly but surely regaining my ability to think. Somehow I could just see in the dark from a tiny pinhole in the door that let in just enough light to enable me to see shapes and make out objects. What the fuck are we doing? What the fuck is going on? I hissed. Slowly my best best friend Tom helped me and so did my brother Rick and finally even Jerry pitched in. Alan was nowhere in sight. We found out later he'd managed to get home somehow and began replacing all of the boxes as close to the way that we had found them when we decided to try the door. Straining through the sweat and the side effects of near carbon dioxide poisoning, we cracked the door, the tiniest of slivers, gulping the cold pristine winter air coming down the stairs while straining through the gap to decipher any kind of sound or movement that would mean having to restack the boxes, barricade the door, and cower in fear for who knows how much longer. Fortunately, there weren't any. When we emerged, we found that we weren't the only ones who sought refuge in the basement. We could see signs of the washing machine and the dryer pulled out from the wall as though someone had been hiding behind them. Boxes and furniture pulled out from under the stairs where someone else had hidden and even a dilapidated mattress halfway up the wall and sprawled on the floor where someone had tried to cover themselves. Climbing the basement stairs, we discovered scuff marks on the wall as though some were desperately trying to retain their footing by crowding the stairs and handprints on the walls as though someone was trying to remain standing while holding on to something or someone. Opening the marred basement door and entering the kitchen, we discovered that windows had been smashed from the inside out. In looking out the near glassless back door, which was hanging by a hinge, revealed a clothesline in tatters, the cedar tree wind fence that had been planted decades ago to block the cold north winds during the winter, had been pulled apart for people to try to squeeze through on their way to their frantic bid for freedom. Standing in the middle of the backyard, looking up towards a windswept sky with shredded clouds and bitter cold blowing through every broken window and door, the roof looked like it was missing shingles, and the second floor bedroom windows were all broken out. Even a broken telephone line off the pole in the back alley swung back and forth and told of their manic flight. People had left objects in their wake too, like purses, bottles, cans shirts, bits of clothing, packs of cigarettes, roach clips, and paraphernalia, like pipes and cigarette lighters, and even a wallet. It was like something out of a science fiction novel, where an entire populace had somehow been yanked violently and unmasked into another dimension. The rest of the house was the same, windows smashed, doors broken, holes in the walls, one leading to a locked door, Jerry's father's den. Fortunately, they couldn't get in. It took us all the better part of the next four days to get as much as we could cleaned up, patched, windows caulked and holes spackled and painted before his parents got home, but they knew. Try as we might, there was simply too much damage. That was the first and last party we ever had at Jerry's house. After graduation, Jerry was kicked out of his parents' house for good. A couple of years later, I heard that his mother had a stroke and died, and his father followed a year later. I talked to Jerry only once after that, and it wasn't a friendly visit. Tom joined the army as an MP. Alan got five years for Grand Theft Auto. My brother Rick was sent to a juvenile detention center for one year, 
and then on to live with my stepfather's family as a foster son in Spencer, Iowa. They were Jehovah's Witnesses out of the pan and into the fire. Mike went back to school to get his GED, and I went to work to save up enough money to hitchhike across the country, still facing or daring my fears. I hitched all over the west, going up and down the California coast, the California coastal mountain range, the Sierra Nevadas, the Grand Tetons, the Great Divide, the U.S. and Canadian Rockies, the Cascades, the Great Basin, the Mojave, the Sonoran, and the El Chihuahuan Deserts for almost two years, climbing that tree before going back to school for an elusive bachelor's, but that's another story. Number two. So on July, my neighbor, we'll call him Larry, was outside and making homemade moonshine for our apartment complex, and it was a very hot day that day. Later on that night, I was laying down because I had a migraine, and my husband and birth father were in the living room when we all heard screaming and everyone freaking out. My neighbor had yelled, You fucking stabbed me! What happened was a different neighbor, we'll call him David, stabbed Larry in the abdomen, and he yelled. Larry took five steps back and told him to back off. David lunged at Larry again, and Larry took out a pocket knife he always carried on him, and he grabbed David's hand, and they twirled around with each other for a moment, and broke the white picket fence in front of our apartments. Then Larry stabbed David, and I heard people screaming, Oh my god! You killed him. He's dead. So I jumped out of bed and ran out the door. I didn't actually think that happened and wanted to try to calm everyone down. I knew all these people and I got out the door and went around the corner and David's sister was holding him up. I checked for a pulse and there wasn't one. And he had been laying in a pool of blood and had bled out. And that's my terrifying neighbor story. Here's the link to the news article. You can use it if you want to, but if it's too gruesome to tell, let me know because I have other stories. Not so disturbing, but creepy nonetheless. Number 3. The Plague Glass Window It was a warm spring morning at the store where my mother worked. I was about 13 or so, having at the age of 9 developed what they used to call juvenile diabetes, and was inclined to stay as close to my mother as possible. Diabetes was every hungry kid's nightmare, because that was a sure way to end snacking on all kinds of sugary delights, which meant no more consuming of those confections that almost every kid in the world, or at least to my knowledge in America, craved back then. For me, it was sugar-free candies, cookies, and drinks, it was Shasta Fresca and Tab Soda, which I detested. And one candy I never knew how to pronounce, spelled E-S-T-E-E, -E, which was French for star. My dietary regimen was so tight, it nearly drove me out of my young, adventurous mind. Because of my diabetes, my mother and I had become very close. I had to be injected twice a day and eat three meals at certain times every day, so she was the only one on hand for that. So I of course went with her everywhere she went. I knew she was always trying desperately to get me to my next birthday and beyond, so I did my best to comply. Deep down, I knew she was right, and because I loved her so much, I did what I was supposed to do in her understanding of what the doctor ordered. After a while, she figured it all out. We both did. And because I did not die in front of her, I was eventually able to have more freedom. It was a learning experience for us both. During that time, my dad, who does not deserve the title, decided to become an asshole and left my mother for another woman. She was forced to go to work to support the six girls they had together, alone. At the time, she worked in a convenience store that was situated on the outskirts of town, in front of two one-way streets, one going east, one going west, 
and a train track running on a raised rail bed right in the middle, all of which were clearly visible through the store's large play class window. Because the neighborhood was in a rural area, a part of the view was marred by the awful gray-black sickness erupting from the many factory smokestacks, and thank God it was not so close that it ruined the view entirely, yet the ugly contents that choked the air were detrimental to our and our residents' health. This was the South in the 70s, and air pollution was not as widely understood or accepted as a health risk back then. Because I went with her everywhere, I always accompanied my mother to work, and because the litigation laws were more lax back then, I was allowed to and knew it helped her peace of mind. Being diabetic, I was an avid reader, despite being a natural-born adventurer, a tomboy they called girls like me back then. I found as much solace in helping my mother as I would exploring the woods and creeks and abandoned houses with my older sister by reading adventure magazines and books on display that were stocked on the shelves at the store. My adventuring was reading Ellery Queen and Alfred Hitchcock mini-magazines and compilations with multiple authors that were chock full of horror, mystery, and adventure short stories. But horror mysteries were always my favorite. I called them then, as I do now, scaries. Also, I love the full-color cat and horse magazines. One of the pictures in the cat magazine reminded me of Samantha, my seal point Siamese, who would later turn out to be my cat Shiloh's mother, and the rock and roll mags. Sometimes I even read Rona Barrett, a celebrity critic of the time, and once the True Detective magazine, but I shied away from those because the photos were so graphic, real, and awful. Whenever I searched for a new magazine like Fangoria, the horror magazine, my eyes would inevitably stray to the True Detective magazines, and I would be forced to avert my eyes because the cover showed actual police photos of murder, suicide, and accident victims. One early Sunday morning at the store, looking out through the large plate glass window, I remember the sky was an unusually deep shade of blue, with just a smattering of wispy clouds racing across the vastness. I was immersed in an Ellery Queen murder mystery when I was interrupted by the sudden jingling of the store bell. It was a handsome friend of my mother's who was always trying to date her but would always be put off, yet sometimes still tease her, a fanciful grin on his smiling face. You know, it would be so nice if I had a beautiful woman like you to have dinner with. You got that part right. She was beautiful, and I'm not being prejudiced just because I'm her daughter. And she'd smile and shake her head, no. And he'd raise his eyebrows and throw in, or lunch? And she'd shake her head, no, again. And he'd go further with, okay, how about in an hour right here? Stabbing his index finger down on the counter. No, she said more adamantly, and you know why. Then he'd stop and look at her, square in the face and say, you can't blame me for trying. And then my mother would laugh. This guy had been trying to get her to go out with him for months now. But because he was in the middle of a divorce, my mother was loath to let it go any further. After what she'd already been through with my idiot dad, it was more than what she needed right then. The nicest part about it, though, was they were still friends. And because he was a cop... He helped to shy away a lot of bad people with bad intentions from the store. If anyone still tried, they were either really desperate, really stupid, or really drunk. After my mother's would-be suitor departed, frustrated and forlorn, I had just gone back to my Ellery Queen magazine and our early Sunday morning piece when the store bell jingled again, alerting us to new customers that turned out to be three tipsy guys reeking trouble. Seeing this motley crew in her store, my mother's shrewd eye took it all in, and with her head down, and armed with a quick smile, waited for the worst. Because it was a Sunday, there was no alcohol for sale, 
Arkansas still had what was called Sunday Blue Laws, where alcohol sales were illegal from about 1 o'clock Sunday morning until 8 a.m. Monday. I remember thinking about my mother's trusty baseball bat nestled in the corner on the underside of the counter, directly under the cash register. She'd used it a few times. It was made of maple and the handle was braided in black electrical tape. She had fastened herself for a firmer grip. She had shellacked the wood and kept it shiny with a can of pledge that she had on hand and christened it Joe after Jolton Joe DiMaggio who had played with the New York Yankees back in the day and would later marry the beautiful Marilyn Monroe. We'd already been alerted when our early morning quiet was first interrupted by a huge truck in the parking lot. It ground its rear bumper into the curb, creating a nerve-shattering screech that made us and the neighborhood cats and dogs for about three miles go nuts. It was the same sound we'd heard before, but was unable to identify the source. Now we knew, when it looked like the same truck we'd seen earlier, flying by on the westbound lane, just outside the store, going way over the speed limit. From my little stool in the corner, I watched the larger of the three head to the back of the store. The other two went to the chip aisle and were pawing the bags a little too loudly in an obvious distraction when I heard the big one in the back yell out in his deep southern accent, Shit, why won't the door open? I saw my mother's body tense, her right arm previously hanging loosely at her side, now tightened into a clenched fist, just above Jolt and Joe. The large guy came shuffling quickly to the counter, demanding, Why is them cooler doors locked? Calmly, she looked into his bloodshot eyes, her own beautiful brown with green and gold flecks, looked at him, unafraid, and said softly, It's Sunday. He blinked as if unsure of the answer. I watched as his eyes dropped, darting around the room as if looking for someone to help me out here. But his accomplices were oblivious, still molesting the merchandise in the chips aisle, when his eyes suddenly grew wide, his mouth forming the letter O but not making any sound. His head nodding slightly, almost in agreement when somewhere deep inside his small, inebriated brain the lights flickered on, at least momentarily. His need to save face transformed his comically bewildered facial features from customer inconvenience to feigned outrage. The thought of not being able to sate his growing hangover with more hair of the dog had taken hostage what little reason he had left and given way to an insatiable need to further dim his mind. Assuming there was any more left to dim. When he told my mother to unlock the door, she calmly took the key out of the drawer without saying a word. Somehow her calm irritated him, enough for him to grab onto her shoulder with his large, fat hand. I saw the calm go out of her as he squeezed her shoulder hard, her right hand desperately searching for the bat. Silently, I slid off the wooden stool. My mother's struggle first and foremost in my mind. The other two seemed to be unaware of the goings-on at the moment and continued their assault on the snack aisle. I could hear them to my far right, but could no longer see them. As my long, skinny, 13-year-old legs went down on my hands and knees, crawling like a granddaddy long legs, the distance to where she stood, it seemed like it took me a millennium to reach her and our hero, Joe. My mother had her right hand clasped like iron onto the edge of the counter, afraid the drunken thug would pull her over the top and do worse to her and possibly me. I knew I was the main reason she held on, and I was going to help her in any way I could. Moving undiscovered, I reached for Joe. My mother felt my presence behind her. I lifted the bat in my left hand. She loosened her right from the end of the counter, and in one swift movement, Joe was out of my hand and into hers, and the asshole went down instantly onto his knees as the back connected with his left upper arm. I hit down the left field line. 
It went limp and hung useless at his side as he stood up, turned swiftly around, almost falling to his knees again, and fled for the door. The other two abandoned their obvious charade, but, unlike him, they got away not so empty-handed. They too flew, but with a few bags of chips and cookies. We heard them pull out of the parking space, which they had backed into to make for a speedy escape, assaulting us again with that horrid screeching sound and the accompanying chorus of cats and dogs in the surrounding neighborhood. Sadly, it took my mother some time to pull herself together to call the cops. He'd hurt her when he gouged her shoulder. She'd learned from experience that not much else could be done. There were no video cameras. She had to call them anyway. While waiting for them to arrive, we kept seeing what looked like the same big truck speeding through the intersection and over the railroad crossing in different directions. After the police showed up and took down the information about the three sheets to the wind shoplifters and an APB for assault that almost ruined our Sunday morning, we realized it could have been a lot worse and took it all in stride. Fortunately, there was not as much traffic in the store or on the streets, it being Sunday, so it gave us more time to calm down and slowly get back to work. Most of the regulars had partied out the night before and were still sleeping it off. The faithful were at church begging forgiveness for imbibing too much while swearing to God it would never happen again, which it inevitably would. Their earnest pleadings the week before all but completely forgotten, having learned nothing about the meaning of the word contrition. But the truth was, they really didn't want to stop, and who could blame them? As long as they stayed home and out from behind the wheel of a moving vehicle, or doing themselves or someone else harm, like the three thugs at the store, what difference would it make to anyone other than themselves, or their families, if they had any? Or their god? As the afternoon wore on, I watched through the plate glass window, a young man pulled up his white Honda into the parking lot next to my mother's 98 gold olds. The afternoon sun made the gold on my mother's car an even richer shade with a brilliant goldfish tinge glinting off his new white helmet. I watched him dismount and head for the door, the bell jingling as he entered. Again sitting quietly, picking up where I left off, reading my Ellery Queen, I heard my mother and the young man talking. He mentioned that the motorcycle he rode up on was a new Honda, and that he was so happy to have it. His old bike was not starting properly, and he was overjoyed that his new bike would get him to work on time. Now he wouldn't have to worry about that anymore, he said. I lowered my eyes after he gave off a huge smile my way and paid for his RC Cola. He downed the entire bottle and ate the moon pie he bought in a matter of seconds. It seemed as if he was a bit nervous and in a hurry. After throwing away the wrapper and handing the empty bottle back to my mother for the five cent deposit. A great way back then to reuse the glass and help keep the environment clean. I noticed his blonde hair was braided and a long rope down his back. The blue of his eyes bid my mother and me a good morning and we watched him leave the store. The helmet he had tucked under his left arm when he had entered was now placed securely back on his head as he started the engine and rode out of the parking lot. We heard him ride by a couple of times, test riding his new bike. The large truck that had been racing by had disappeared, but then suddenly showed up again, barreling airborne over the railroad crossing. Like I'd said, the railroad tracks went parallel along the front of the convenience store above and between two one-way streets right outside. Two bisecting two-way streets crossed both one ways and the train tracks. From the plate glass window, we could see one of the two ways go up and cross the rail bed. Because the two-way crossed the railroad tracks and had a stop sign, anyone crossing the tracks would have to have given the right of way to the train. But if there was no train visible, motorists, teenagers mostly, would gun their engine up the hill and run the stop sign at the railroad crossing 
to get as much height as possible before coming down hard on the other side. Normal drivers would stop before crossing the rail bed and then drive down the hill to the parking lot, park their car, or truck, or motorcycle, and enter the store to the accompaniment of the store bell. Crossing the elevated rail bed at a normal rate of speed gave the customer a pretty good view of the convenience store parking lot from the top of the hill and gave customers an enticement to come in. Occasionally there would be an actual train that would cross the rail bed above, but it wasn't as used much now since the city had become more modernized. In front of me, and at a certain time of day, the sun would shine almost directly into the store, through the plate glass window, but at an angle so as not to blind you. The windows were tinted to reduce the UV rays, and with the golden light, gave off a pink hue that I wasn't crazy about because I hate the color pink, but hey, it was beautiful, and nature meant a lot to me in so many ways back then, regardless the color, and still does today. Reading my Alfred Hitchcock magazine, having finished the Ellery Queen, I looked up to see what looked like the giant getaway truck bounding over the tracks. I remember my mother being worried that someone might lose control and run into the store. I could see the concern in her eyes as we spoke about it, and I saw relief come over her when she remembered the huge concrete curb and the bright yellow and black painted cement guard posts set up at the corners of the store. They were there to prevent that from happening. For anything like that to happen, it would take a freak accident. So there was nothing much to be concerned about from our location, or so we thought at the time. At one point, what looked like the getaway truck decided to finally give it a rest after nearly plowing head first into one of the concrete posts. But a closer look revealed that it wasn't the creeps after all. There were two couples in the truck cabin, and because it was a popular spot for racing your vehicle, it wasn't long before they got back at it all over again. The kid, Joy riding his new bike, now rode by on the other side of the rail bed. We could just make out the white gleam of the helmet as he passed. He was going the speed limit. The two couples in the truck were not. As the big truck moved down the hill, we saw his taillights disappear on the other side of the tracks. We could just hear the little lawnmower sounding engine of the Honda as it moved onto the street close to the store. At the same time, we heard the roar of the giant truck headed back toward the railroad crossing. The same scenario played out several more times when I heard my mother's voice change, just as I began again to read. I remember my eyes lifted from the page, half expecting some kind of new commotion. The song Cars filtered through my mind momentarily, but was quickly ripped away with my mother's anguished cry. Oh. My. God. No. Her voice grew shrill at the end of each word until they were drawn out into an ear-splitting scream like the high-pitched call of a bird. Somehow she reacted seconds before it happened. She was good at that sort of thing, just not always in time to stop it or do anything about it. That she had prevented many mishaps and dangerous things from happening to us personally and others in the past. Transfixed her scream still echoing in my ears, I stared into her horror-filled eyes for mere seconds, and then I saw from the corner of my eye, and in full view, burned in my memory. The black truck had jumped the tracks just as the kid on the cycle passed in front of them. The truck with the two couples hit the kid just right so that what I thought was his helmet flew off at an odd angle through the air and down on the ground, not thirty feet from the front of the store. I remember the shiny new white of the helmet seemed to dim and take on a slightly pinkish hue as it finally came to rest on the ground. I don't remember seeing what happened to the rest of him, only the helmet bumping oddly across the street. As for the rest of him, maybe my mind would not let me remember the truck coming down onto the boy's still living body, or maybe not. I don't know, 
but what caused me to drop my magazine was the look on my mother's face as she whirled around to look into my eyes as if searching desperately for what to do next. I rose immediately and went to her. Her arms surrounded me as she was careful not to let me look out of the plate glass window. I remember how her body felt rigid and taut. After a few moments she suddenly let go of me and her hand moved to the phone. She called the police to report an accident. Eventually her cop friend showed up and spoke with her about it. They spoke in low tones thinking I could not hear, but I have very good hearing and I had heard everything they said. My mother knew I was strong for my age and knew I had seen the accident. She did not know exactly how much I had seen until I talked to her about it later. I did not see or remember seeing the young man get hit, just the helmet in the air, which should not have been, occupying for only a matter of seconds space and time before falling heavily onto the ground, rolling in odd circles before coming to rest on the westbound side of the street. A few days later I talked to her again about the accident. Something was not right about it. I could not understand the way the helmet arced in the air. It seemed heavier than it had been when he put it on outside the store. When it hit the street, it rolled strangely, bumping and bouncing as though there was something heavy in it. It just did not seem right. Looking her square in the face, I asked her what I had heard her cop friend say. Was that actually what happened? I needed to know if what I heard was correct. She nodded with a very slight shake of her head and then blurted out, Yes. Then the quieter, Yes. I had never felt so bad for someone I did not know. Her cop friend had stated that the truck had struck the young man in a way that could only be called a freak accident. When the truck was on its way back down after the jump over the tracks, it somehow hit the kid on his motorcycle in such a way as to physically knock his head off his body. I could not remember seeing the impact, but I and my mother saw the helmet and thought of the poor boy's head still contained inside, with a long blonde braid and his blue eyes as it made its way through the air, the blood that splattered the pristine white, dulling it into a soft pink, visible from even across the street through the plate glass window. For months, the way it rolled around on the ground, lopsided, as though heavier on one side, kept going through my mind over and over. Later, she asked to be transferred to another store. I could not blame her. It took a long time to get over the visceral horror that was visited upon us that day in our quiet little corner on the outskirts of town. And I thank Christ in heaven that my mother and I got through it. But to this very day, I still shiver whenever I see a rider on a motorcycle. And I still remember the plate glass window tinged pink against the UV rays of an early morning sun. Hey y'all, Kill the Orange Cat here. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, please feel free to click the subscribe button and bell below, or click the icon of Ichigo the Cat that will appear at the end of this closing. Leave me a comment and share this video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have an original story you'd like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. But most importantly, don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.